people want to pay me not to make the mistakes I have made. And of course, on top of that, you want to add, you want to add some stress of living for five years in Nigeria, you know, dealing with a lot of problems. If your life career protects you from going through some really, really deep shit, then how else will you be able to build um, humility in your So you don't learn from successes? Because you can go to Nigeria for 21 years just because you, someone claims you stole his money. Uh, let's get this. Uh, go on, it's like it's natural. That's how yeah, it's supposed yeah, yeah. to be. <laughs>
what, uh, what, what the book is about and what the story was really about, what really happened. Because I you can't explain this in a tweet. Like, it, it, it requires a book. I, I had two problems happened. with the story. Go ahead. We talked about it uh, several times. One is that your uh, character yeah. seems quite immature in yeah. a book, yes? And it, it has some comments or some experiences yeah. that I don't f it doesn't fit you. Yeah. How come? So th the way I wanted to write the book, and maybe this is not as clear in the Polish version as I wanted to, and I kind of is fixed it clearer it in English? In English? I made it clearer in the beginning of the book, is that the narrator, so me telling that story, gets mature as the book goes. So when I'm talking about my experiences of my first businesses when I was 21, I'm talking about this from a perspective of a 21 year old. Okay. When I'm talking about the stuff that happened to me when I was 30, I'm talking about this from a perspective of that 30 year old guy. So the book, the narrator gets mature with the book uh, as, as the story goes. That, that's Which you need to read the whole book to understand. And now I understand that you, uh, in a preface, you explain it or somewhere? Yes, that, that's what I'm doing. And you know, my- So read the preface. And, 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 and I hope and the, the whole book. book, yeah. So um, what happened also in Poland, that was a big lesson, is that we published the first chapter as a way to entice people to the book. And it wasn't very... And there was a lot of backlash because of, uh, okay. because of that, because many people, I guess they wouldn't be my readers or followers or fans uh, in the end anyway, but they would assume that the book is like a soup. You take one spoon and you already know how the whole jar tastes. But that's not what the book is all about. Like so maybe first chapter wasn't the best one to publish. Showing just the first chapter without the proper preface that this is not how the whole book is about, that this is maybe intentionally supposed to uh, spark some controversy, but then so many other things happen. That could, be, that could have been done better. We'll come back to learning. The second point I actually disagreed with you. I'm an investor. Yeah. I invest in startups. Yeah. Um, you've uh, made an awesome career coming from a small town in Poland, uh, having a startup in Poland, going to uh, Africa, to Nigeria with Rocket Internet, building a business there. Then you started a new uh, venture by yourself with friends. And then you created a structure that for investor is not clear because there was a company in Poland, there was a company in Nigeria, you had angel investor money, so people like myself and the funds. It, it, it wasn't uh, super clear from a perspective of an investor what's happening in the companies, was it? So that particular thing that you're mentioning right now was clear for all the investors. Okay. When we launched the company, there was four of us. There was me, my co-founder, and two investors. Okay. Like it's really not hard to explain a structure of two illegal entities when one is in Nigeria, one is in Poland, and we're going to start an umbrella company in a couple months when the money comes. Uh, the problem with me that I have made, the many bad decisions were in, in, when I was running the company were due to the fact that I was very confident, almost to an extent cocky, uh, cocky uh, thank you for that word, aggressive. Many times at a meeting with one of my investors that used to be my friend, I would take advantage of our relationship, of, of our friendship, and I would say, just stop giving me that bullshit, let me do my job because I know what I'm so doing. So you didn't explain everything? Yes, I did many mistakes and, and I'm very harsh on myself from that perspective in the book as a, as a CEO and as a founder that didn't know how to manage the investors, that didn't appreciate the fact that they have a different perspective. They might, they might have a different opinion. Uh, this is not my company anymore. I also have responsibility towards them. Just because I was the biggest investor doesn't mean I can do whatever I want all the time. So that for sure, and I was very, and I think in the book, I'm very frank about this and I'm very honest about this. But that's one thing. The other thing, which now brings us to this last part of the book, is the moment when one of the investors decides to teach me a lesson in an illegal way. He doesn't choose to um, exercise his right as an investor to try to remove me from the board the legal way, talk to other investors to convince me. Actually, he did that, but he failed. Then he decide, decided to teach me a lesson he's, the way he always was used to. So basically bribing the Nigerian police to issue a fake arrest warrant after me. And you got arrested on the airport. And then I got, I got arrested at the airport. Then I got a phone call that if I pay as much money as the other side wants, the arrest warrant then disappears in a magical way in a couple, couple of days. Because that's the way some investors are forcing their business partners to, 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 you know, to do what they want them to do. So let's divide those two things. Me being a cocky co-founder, making bad business decisions, from someone accusing me to intentionally doing something against the company or against other business So, so what did you learn from these interactions, not from legal case and so on, but more from interactions with investors that failed? Um, 
so while while these things have happened, now from the hindsight, um, I just basically learned that I was too young to be at that particular position and too cocky and too. Mark I, Zuckerberg was even younger when he started Facebook, so it's a how question. can you use Mark Zuckerberg as a rule? Like he's that an exception. Be, that on that so would many be levels. very yeah. curved rule. Yeah. Um, I think that I have uh, that didn't have enough maturity, and sometimes and you do now was the noun of was the noun of, of the humble is the adjective was the noun. I didn't I wasn't humble enough to appreciate okay. someone else's uh, point of view, um, and of course on top of that you want to you want to add some stress of living for five years in Nigeria, you know, dealing with a lot of problems, growing your company, funding, etc. A lot of stress on top of each other. That was still the time when I didn't really understand how your biology affects your decision making. How your bio how does your biology well, if affect you're, if your decision making? If you're if you're stressed all the time, if you don't sleep enough, if you don't work out, if sometimes instead of working out you would have one drink too many just to release the stress, like those things affect your biology, and that biology affects the decision making. Of, uh, the decision making exactly. So that that was a big lesson. So so you learned humility. For sure. When you are you starting a new business anytime soon? Um, oh yeah, well all the time. However, my um, risk aversion <laughs> is, high. is by an order of magnitude um, because the, the the bad things that happen to you just kind of stay in your subconsciousness. I realized that uh, so that all this happened to me when I was thirty two. That was a pretty intense experience for me when I spent a night in jail, for thinking that I'm going to be tr uh, transported to Nigeria, where I'm going to spend twenty one years to jail, mm -hmm. because you can go to Nigeria for twenty one years just because you someone claims you stole his money. Mm -hmm. So that was a life changing experience for me. Then I realized that. So there was that night in uh, jail cell in, in, in the, the Warsaw in airport. Warsaw. Yeah, it was. It was it actually it was in Rakovetska Street. It was like this okay. uh, notorious jail. I've realized that all my experiences throughout my life career before that particular situation, all those bad things that happened to me, all those problems, all those challenges were just so much smaller than what happened to me at that night. And that changed your risk aversion and outlook totally. on life? And humidity and everything else. Because if your life is a common series of smaller or bigger successes, I don't want this to sound too cheesy, but if your life career protects you from going through some really, really deep shit, then how else will you be able to build um, a humidity in your society? So you don't learn from successes? Uh, success is a lousy teacher. I don't know who said that. I heard it from mm -hmm. Bill Gates. Uh, n you definitely not learn as valuable lessons from success as you can learn from mistakes. So what did you learn from this ordeal except humility? Mm -hmm. I, I'm definitely making all my decisions now much slower than I used to. Okay. Every time I'm supposed to answer someone a message or answer to a business offer or answer an email that is very emotionally triggered, I will never allow myself to do it immediately. I will always shut down the laptop and uh, go to the gym and reply. So wait for the emotions hours. to subside. Yeah. I've also learned that it doesn't matter what type of business is at stake. If you scratch the problem strongly enough, at the end of the scratching, there's always some emotional problem or there's always some ego problem. I think I underestimated how big, how many business problems are actually triggered by personality issues, by ego issues, by, by stuff that can be solved or prevented if you focus on the right communication. So your ego is manageable, but your personality has changed? I'm um, not sure if I'm the person to reply, to answer that question, but... Mm. Let's try. It has to. We'll, it has we'll, to. we'll invite your other half and she'll tell us more. <laughs> but uh, for now, let's try. Yeah, she's my best, uh, she's my best attorney to, to explain that. It, it had to. It had to. Okay. Just, just, just looking at the sh sheer size and sheer number of, of experience I had to endure. Because the problem of spending the night in jail, thinking I'm going to spend an, an another 21 year, one years in jail, was just the beginning. Then was an 18 months of, of legal battle. Uh, to to not only win justice in courts, but then start clearing my name. Okay. Uh, because it's very easy to throw some sh mud on someone. But so that was a very interesting thing. So there's th this whole smear campaign against me went on on Twitter, and everyone j jumped on the in bandwagon Nigeria. in Nigeria. My mistake that I've uh, that I have done is that I was really harsh on Nigerian corruption. And I, I, but I was really precise in terms of statistics. Everything I said, Nigeria is very corrupt, police but is very were, corrupt. You were attacking the pride of a nation. But I was attacking the pride of a nation, and they would go and defend the other side. They didn't care about the, 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 case, the substance of the case. They would just defend because someone attacked their country. That was a lesson for me. Also, in terms of managing 
uh, public relations. Did uh, you write about this in a, in a new yes, book? Yes, it's, it's in the book. And actually, that, that's, that's a big chunk of my lessons. That's when I also realized that many people that pretended they were always on my side, they were my friends, we would go on conference together, we would do some small deals business-wise together, etc. When this smear campaign against me was triggered in Nigeria, them without even asking me what's my version of the story, they would just go afterwards, after me uh, in a public way. And that was very painful, but then also very liberating to want to to, to really realize who, who was really on your side, who wasn't. There's a saying a friend of mine once told me, and I live by Friends it. come and go, and enemies, enemies accumulate. accumulate. Yes, yeah. Yeah. that's the saying. That, 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 was, that, was, that was a big uh, lesson um, uh, for me. But where was I? Okay, uh, th coming I back to the anecdote. So it's very easy to, to, to throw mud on someone, and that's also entertaining for the spectators. And a lot of comments when the smear campaign started was that, yeah, of course, he's a bad guy, blah, 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 etc. Then when I finally, after a couple of weeks, collected all the evidence together and absolutely obliterated the arguments of the other side, many comments I got was that, oh, this is boring now. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Especially it was a month later. Yeah. So since you're not going to publish another book about the lessons, tell us, you know, three, five, seven, ten lessons that you learned in the last six months from publishing that book. One, you already talked about social yeah. uh, campaigns. What else did you learn? Um, you, you said that uh, in a previous interview that this was your beta testing, doing it on a Polish market just to see on a smaller language yeah. market how yeah. to publish a book. I think what worked very well in my case is that I have mixed the business insights I wanted to share with a with couple of interesting life stories that I had and kind of mixed it together. Because like in a stand-up comedy, most stand-up comedies are really about passing an, a, a, a message to, to someone. Most comedians are one of the most intelligent people in the world. This is why I love stand-up comedy. But coming back to the book, when you tell someone your life story, you open up to him, he appreciates that. You make him smile, uh, you make him maybe become a little bit nostalgic or you scare him a little bit. He's living through the life journey with you and at that moment he's becoming open to whatever message you want to you wanna pass to him. So when you look at the structure of my book, there are like 15 or 16 chapters where there's always a, a key life story in that chapter. And then in between I'm throwing some business insight that I wanted to share that I, I figured are very interesting because not many people were able to share that. So that worked that worked very well. Um, in my case, you know, very pragmatic uh, approach. It, Poland was a test for me to, to launch a book with a publisher. Uh, I wanted to publish this book with a big powerful publisher that has a reputation behind it and Agora I think was the case because not only is a big publisher. Why did you want that? Uh, to build credibility okay, and also to uh, take advantage of their power in media because they're not okay. only a publisher, they have radio stations, newspapers, and, and, and online sites. And how well the book sold? So in two months, we've done uh, sales enough to become a bestseller. So if in two months, we've okay. done sales, which is the sales of a year in order to become a bestseller. Okay. That's more or less 10,000. Uh, 10, and Poland has a small book market. It's a very, very, very small market for Poland. So for Poland, it was a great, it was a great number. And but I you also had an audio version and an ebook version, yes? We also launched an audiobook and an ebook version. Actually, the hard copy was the biggest yes. sales, the best okay. seller. However, um, the audiobook receivers were the most engaged uh, receivers of the book. In terms of communication with you? In terms of communication with me. Of course, it was a great lector. I think the audiobook as a product is much better product than hard copy. Okay. Uh, especially when you look at the reviews, the reviews of the audiobook are 20% better than the reviews of the hard copy. And I believe that 20% was given to me by a great actor, okay. a professional one. Uh, my age, he really kind of felt my story. So who's going to read your English version? Uh, there's, 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 a, there's an actor from, uh, from Great Britain. Uh, he's going to have a, a, a very tough Time job learning to do. the Polish Also, that's, that's one, but also the benchmark because of how well the, okay. the, the English audiobook um, uh, came out. The Polish audiobook. The Polish, the Polish audiobook um, uh, came out. Um, good lesson here, pragmatic lesson here, is that although the, the publisher was very powerful in Poland and he gave me a lot of exposure in so-called mainstream media, um, the, the most r positive reception and, and I think most of the, the, the right readers that I really wanted to reach to actually came from the from the entourage that I understood that I already had some kind of an access to, uh, thanks to my activity so your on social, social media, media etc. Yeah, so, um, so you're self-publishing the, the English version? The, the English version I'm actually self-publishing. Wow, because Big I change. Uh, yeah, I, I 
care, uh, because I already got everything I wanted in, in Poland thanks to a partnership with a big publisher. Mm -hmm. Now, when I'm publishing this in English, my core readers, my core circle I want to reach out to, so 25 to 45 people interested in tech, emerging markets, business, I can easily reach to them on my own using online channels. I know how to do online marketing. I already know how to reach to them with content marketing. Uh, that group of people is big enough in countries like States, UK, Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, because these are my main core markets to, to, to launch the book in. So you know five markets you're going to be attacking. Those, those are my five main markets. Uh, going with a traditional publisher in somewhere in the States, hoping that he will bring me some sales in Barnes & Noble, maybe. Uh, but in return, giving out more than half of my of my earnings and no control and giving the total control of the book price and marketing channels etc i think i just kind of uh, okay. decided how to do how will you take care of distribution because these are geographically very spread markets yeah so for the states we will use a lot of help with amazon like i'm okay. going to do the drop shipping okay and for the african countries we're actually going to have our small local distribution hubs in each country in each country yeah so you want okay. you want to send it you, you, you publish the book uh, centrally in one, actually we're publishing the English book in Poland, mm -hmm. and then we're sending the bulks to all of these countries where we have uh, small distribution centers. Yeah. How many books are you printing in a first print? 20,000. Okay, yeah. so more than you sold in the Polish version, so that's... Yeah, yeah. It's I a big market. I, I hope that we will be able to sell way more books. Uh, not looking only at the pure revenue, Angle because as you probably you remember, all of my income goes to the foundation, which I hope you will also ask me about. But this was about uh, the Polish edition. I was going to ask you: is, the, is, the, one, is yeah. the English uh, all my edition going to go to foundation? Yeah, because that's where the real money can be uh, to, to fuel that foundation. Uh, and the foundation is doing what? Uh, so the foundation is called Maya. It's from um, I've launched this together with Jarica, my. Mm -hmm. Uh, future ex-girlfriend, as I like to say. Because future ex-girlfriend. <laughs> because there's going to okay. be a progress of this relationship, if you know okay. what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we've decided, okay, th there's a lot of philosophy behind this, uh, behind this foundation, but the bottom line is that we want to redistribute the luck in life. I consider myself extremely lucky to be born in Poland. I only knew what hunger is after I, after I discovered intermittent fasting. My parents paid for my education. I was super lucky. You're yeah, uh, a white European, white European successful, male, etc. Educated. Uh, educated. And uh, I want to kind of even out those chances uh, with some people who are very, very fucked in life. If, and we start with Maidoguri, which is a city in Borno State where you have Boko Haram, where you have tribalistic culture and a very, very conservative religion that doesn't put women at the pedestal. I just put it this way. And you give them laptops, yes, if mm, I remember. No, we actually, that, changed? Th that idea has evolved. So we will be picking out orphan girls because if you're a girl and you're orphan, then you just, you, you, as bad as it gets. Your chances are very low. Very low. But if you're good at maths and you have interest in, in, in science, then there's a chance we can somehow bring you back to the middle class. So there will be a scholarship program which will help a limited number of girls, but it will help them as long as it's needed to bring them back to the middle class. So, so education, through high, first job. Primary school, so high school, internship, wow. um, web development or accounting. Who's managing this for you? There's a, there's a foundation called Feed for Life, which we have a partnership with. Mm -hmm. And also there are a lot of people that I know in Nigeria that kind of decided to join and become an, an advisor and, uh, and a volunteer. But this won't be too big of a project, I think. So uh, 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 yeah. you, you're going to be publishing a book where you can make money. Yeah. You're living in Barcelona, yeah. uh, not in Poland. So what do you make money on? How do you sustain your life? Because <laughs> your story with the foundation needs to be more believable. Yeah. So um, the foundation, I, I also hope that the money from the book will only be the beginning of the money for the foundation. Okay. And the book is supposed to give me exposure. And then every time I go to any interview, uh, I can talk about the book. And but I you can, can also talk about foundation. And I can at least tell someone to buy the book. You're going to support the foundation. But if you want to, you can spend way more money on. However, this is purely non-profit uh, organization. Right now, I make all my money by being an advisor to many technology companies. Which going into Africa. Going into Africa. That's kind so of... So you're actually making money from the knowledge you learned. Uh, people want to pay me not to th make the mistakes I have made. That's a nice definition. Uh, yeah. I kind of had to switch to this because why? Because when I was arrested in January 14, 2018, and then I finally was released, I realized that my bank account was frozen, office and house in Nigeria was, ra was raided, and I see no chance of me being able to travel out of Poland for at least a year. In the end, it was 18 months. 
So I had to quickly figure out a way for me to make money in a different so way. So how do you consult to international companies when you were stuck in Poland? Well, apparently there's a lot of knowledge you can pass while being still in Poland. And there's a, okay. lot of, there's a lot of things you can still do remotely if you have the right knowledge and you have the right connections and networks. And tools. And what? And tools. And tools, of course. Obviously, you can't do this forever, but it mm -hmm. was enough for me. What, one thing you, you never can do for sure is to run a company in Africa while being Remotely. in Europe. That's absolutely impossible. And that, that gate for me was closed. So I wanted to ask you, yeah. when you are 25 year old, yeah. born in Northern Europe yeah. or United States or somewhere there, and um, the world is, you know, kind of developing in Asia and yeah. Africa and so on, you haven't learned the Chinese. Yeah. What would be your advice to people who are adventurous, they want to do business and so on, what to do, where to go, Read your book, obviously, that would be the first one. Yeah. But generally, how would you kick off such a person's uh, ambitions? Are there still people like this being born in those regions? <laughs> you were. I was, yeah. But, you know, I, I hope that people who design their lives and listen to this uh, podcast and watch this YouTube channel uh, yeah. once in a while might actually come up with this idea. Yeah. Let's screw it. Let me move on. Yeah. Well, for sure, there's like there's still so many interesting. Would, okay, let me use the word not developed as well as the so-called first world countries. There's so many of them in Southeast Asia, in the uh, old uh, in Soviet Republic. Uh, there's so still the so many is countries like this in and America. Going or what? I mean, that depends on what you want to do. Because many people I've I've met. I'm meeting when I go to a conference or I meet in business, they're like, okay, I've been doing some things in Poland for a couple of years and I think I want to go to Africa and, and help and help those regions support them. Uh, and then I'm asking like, what do you actually have to offer? Because, because they're they developing. Yeah. They're developing. There's way more people than you expect having way more skills than, than you do. I was lucky enough because I jumped into the stage where Nigerian e-commerce was really at the very beginning and my experiences in, in, in Poland actually were super helpful. But I wouldn't say that I had anything unique that no one else could, could, could do. And it was Rocket Internet in that also helped. Yeah. And obviously that I have funding. a lot of money, of course. Yeah. So when, when, when you are an, an, an European entrepreneur coming to Africa, for sure you're going to have an advantage in raising money. So maybe you want to team up with a local founder because you can bring the money, he can bring the local expertise, he will make sure you're not going to spend money on stupid things, which happened okay. to me many times. Uh, uh, definitely, Africa is an, is an amazing market for you to 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 work on, to to work in. But it also depends on what you want to do. But Africa is a huge continent with different countries, different languages, different well, yeah, legal systems. Countries, yeah. hundreds. Uh, legal system actually is not that complicated because it's either the one based on French or or, or Anglo-Saxon or British. Yeah. yeah, and if you speak English or French, you're going to be good in most of the African countries. Uh, and there's no time difference. So if you still want to have some connection with Europe. Uh, it's actually way easier to do it from Africa because, of, of, of course, Latin America, Asia, that's like a couple of hours. Um, if you want, if, if you're really like a business cowboy and you want to go to a market that has a lot of chaos because you thrive on chaos and you want to have a lot of competition, not really competition, but challenges, but also the reward is bigger, then definitely that's the country for you. But don't expect that just because you've done something in Europe and you have the education and you've worked here for, for a little while, that gives you an, an edge. Besides the fact that in many cases you will be preferred because of your heritage, uh, there's really not that much for you to uh, to expect that's going to be so much easier. But being business. preferred is not necessarily being better, yeah? No, I never said that, yeah. Okay. No. So, you're publishing a book. For yeah. a year, probably, you're going to promote it. And what's next in your life design? <laughs> so You um, kind of hinted on it on a personal level. Yeah. Yes, that's for sure. And... Uh, so Jarita uh, looks like so she's, she's an actress, and her career is also booming lately. And she's either gonna be involved in some kind of a but it's in Latin America mostly. Uh, so now it's actually Spain. Okay. Uh, and there's way m more and more, you know, Spanish productions focused on Latin America happening in Spain or, or in New York. But she also speaks English very well. But anyway, I think that the the route for me of becoming a hardcore entrepreneur, co-founder of building that builds another Facebook is closed because I'm a little bit a little bit more. Uh, risk averse, and I'm, I don't don't see myself being able to be in for two years straight in one African country because that's what I believe is is something that is needed to to launch the business. Just two years? 
uh, well, at least. Okay. O- o- obviously, then you want to, depends okay. on how your business grows, etc. So I think what worked very well for me in the last two years, also because of the situation, was just, w- w- was, was advising to many, many companies that, that wanted to do something in Africa. Uh, but, and, and somehow I kind of, you know, enjoyed this and I found myself being, one, good at it, two, enjoying it, maybe one comes from the other. So what's your value proposition to the companies uh, in terms of advice? If I wanted to hire you, what would I get? Okay, so I will, I will answer that now and then I will come back to my, my, my plan uh, of designing my yes. life. So, you know, w- as an advisor, like you want to work with either startups which are post series C or D because before that, you're not going to make any money unless you, you can wait a year and work with everyone based on the success fee or just hoping for some shares to, to materialize. So you're either going to work with corporations if you know how to work with them, if you want to work with them, or you want to work with post-series D, post-series C startups who have already proven their concept and are extremely powerful have money. in the core markets. They've raised a lot of money and they, sp- they spend way more money. They want to grow way faster than those corporations because then they need to prove their, their global ability to, uh, to, to scale up. And those, those companies, those startups really need someone like you who, who has already been working in one corporation environment to startup environment they need someone that has had his toes or her toes in both of these worlds. Because people like me, we can launch their businesses way faster in a new okay. market than anyone else. So Rocket Internet had that position. We were actually called global venture developers. Mm-hmm. So we were like internal consultants, like a SWAT team that will go from country to country and quickly launch it. Uber had, has that with, with launcher's position. Glovo has that with launcher's position. Um, so. So that's, that's the value proposition. I think it's the speed. So you're yeah. a launcher. You're a launcher. Like you're setting if the market is the right to launch in. You're checking the environment from the legal perspective, whether the market is ready or not. Time, timing is super important. Then you, of course, set up the entity. You find the first people. You try to track first deals. You kind of kick it off okay. up and running. And then you hire someone to replace you. And, you your make val- your s- and your value proposition is that you can do what better than anybody else? Faster and cheaper than they would do it on their own. Because you're not going to make, you've already make, made the mistake somewhere else. They pay you for the mistakes that you've already made. Okay. And then you make yourself obsolete by replacing yourself. With the building the team, yeah. Yeah, and either switching to another company or, or to another market. So that has been working very well for me. However, now the way I see it, my long-term plan, once I stop enjoying this one, uh, is that the book gives me exposure. Uh, and it, it gave me a lot of exposure in Poland, and I believe it's going to also give me a lot of exposure internationally. Internationally, and exposure means influence. And exposure means being able to pass with some kind so of. So you would message. like to be influencer? <laughs> would you like to be an influencer? I, uh, I think it, yeah, for sure. In the way that influencer, being an influencer, allows you to pass your message to someone. And what's your message? So let me get to that because being influencer just for being an influencer is worthless and it's nothing. Just like being a celebrity for being a celebrity. Um, you want to be someone that is famous because of doing that something. You just don't want to be a, you don't want to be a celebrity just for the sake of the, being a celebrity. So coming back to your question, the book gives me exposure and allows me to pass my message. And my message is, um, I believe in capitalism, in the healthy way of capitalism, without too many corporations not caring about you and destroying the environment, but the low middle, cl- middle SMEs type of uh, capitalism, which kind of is so far one of the best ways to develop the uh, countries. The countries. And by bringing some money to Africa, you kind of can enforce that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that growth because when I look at growth in Africa, there's not enough money coming fro- from local investors. Like, for example, there's almost no money from local investors in Nigeria investing in tech because it's too, too early for them. And it's too risky. Too risky. They still prefer to invest in land or something they understand. They are waiting for the first IPO. So... There's either going to be money from Europe coming to, to fill this, uh, this hole or money from China or someone else to, to fill this hole. So I'm kind of bring, trying to bring that money uh, into Africa uh, by, promoting, uh, by promoting Africa through my book and also telling about negative experiences because it's never peaches and creams, right? But I'm trying to focus on, on good stuff because there's, there's way too much negative things being uh, communicated about Africa. For example, by NGOs who kind of uh, they thrive on it. They thrive on it. They leverage on it. Like they raise money thanks to this. Mm-hmm. I think I kind of want to balance this out. So book is the first thing that gives me exposure. Then I'm invited, like, like I told you, to conferences where I can at least sell a book or maybe also convince a CEO to put some money into the foundation because I believe that my foundation being small, lean, 
uh, never to uh, never will grow into a big organization might be might be pretty effective and it's type of a good type of charity without getting into details because I'm actually about to publish a, by the time this this interview is is live there's already going to be a huge manifesto showing what the foundation is doing now the third thing which we, which we're thinking of launching I think this is going to be for 2020 uh, is we're launching an index fund uh, because so far there's a lot of money being invested into Africa via private equity companies, but obviously you need to be a big company already established in Africa to become an interest of a PE. There's a big hole in terms of uh, seed, seed funding. There's there are a little bit of VC funding, but there's really no proper index fund, which has, a, I think we've discussed it once, which has a passive strategy just by creating a mechanism of pushing money from Europe and the United States into African stock exchanges. I'm not talking only about African companies. Who's we? Because you said you go, we're going to launch a, a team of people that I can't disclose yet. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, you're hearing it here first, but not everything. Not everything. Yes. Um, so we just want to build a mechanism that allows to push some money from the developed markets into African stock exchanges. So I'm going to be able to invest in the growth of Africa, which is somewhat evenly distributed around around those economies. Exactly. Yeah? Imagine a, a, a newly established index called Africa 500, yeah. which is the, consists of 500 biggest African publicly listed stock uh, public uh, companies. Listed companies. Part of them are African Across companies. all the countries. Across the, and all, all, all the exchanges. The well, obviously, we're going to focus on the biggest ones. So yes. Nigeria, uh, Kenya, South Africa, Egypt. And there are, I think, 400 or 300 uh, African companies listed on Singapore Stock Exchange, London Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, because they cared to be IPO'd there for the liquidity. You want to take a part of this, but, but you want to push money down the stream to, to Nairobi Stock Exchange. Because right now, if you want to invest in a, in a Kenyan breweries that are growing, there's no way for you as an European investor. So we want to create the mechanism which is passive, which for you as an investor, whether individual or, or institutional, is just a part of your bigger strategy. And when hard times come for the developed market, this organizations be will be looking for, for a way to, to diversify, uh, diversify uh, those, those risks. How, how much do you want to tour with your book? I think as much as, as, much as there is a high quality interest Okay. Uh, Define high quality. As long interest. as I am, in, as long as I am invited by interesting podcasters and journalists, as long as I am invited by conference that matter with audience that that I want to reach out to, because it's very easy to get busy with that long tail of of media attention, of of social media attention. Because there's just, I think there's like a Pareto rule, like 20% of the titles people have 80% of the quality and, 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 and of the attention. And it's very easy to be, get busy with that, that long tail where really nothing happens, but you think you're doing a lot of stuff. Okay. And, and that kind of steals your time and attention from the other which are re relevant things that you, 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 might, you might be focused on. Marek, um what book would, except yours, mm -hmm. would you recommend for people to read when they wanted to start a business or go a similar path to it than yourself? Mm -hmm. um, so there, there were two books which kind of shaped this book. Um, so the first book was Chaos Monkeys. I read it after your recommendation. You read it. And what do you think about it? I understand your style. Uh, you now understand in the book. my style now, yes. Uh, written by a guy that. Uh, went through this whole Silicon Valley career, a lot of money from different investors. He sold his company to Twitter, then he went to Facebook, mm -hmm. and then he decided it's enough, and he kind of wanted to write a tell-all story. So his cynism, sometimes brutal honesty, it's it kind of, well. uh, it, it reads well. And uh, I also read a book, Leadership BS, mm -hmm. that is kind of giving you a different perspective on, on, on all this long forms of PR articles in a way of a biography book of a lot of CEOs which are resigning and then they kind of have this have this book at the end of their career and that book also tackles the, the, the concept of coaching in business and, and success in business and how many times it's really not quantifiable so how can you really say whether it's valuable or not and, and that kind of book also like give me gave me the, 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 the courage I needed to kind of focus more on my failures and be honest with, with myself and, and be frank and not always try to be uh, like super, uh, like this g book was supposed to be with, with no makeup. Give yourself a distance. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Where are you planning to live after all this stuff? 
moves on. You Barcelona to, is. You need is to ask my girlfriend. Was my, ah, it's a, that's yeah. a, that's a good place to so, live. Yeah, it depends uh, where she chooses the career or yeah. the, where the career takes her. Yeah. Yes. So now that I can finally travel, that I you know won the case in Nigeria and Car, the Interpol finally admitted that they should never have even put this in arrest warrant. The Polish prosecutor admitted that the the extradition case was like absolutely worthless. When someone asked me about where you're based now, I was answering. I don't know, economy premium seat on some kind of an airline. <laughs> That's where I spend most okay. of my time in. Uh, because I absolutely love travel for six months and then for three days I'm, I'm not leaving my house, not my, my, my bed. I'm charging my batteries traveling again. But now when I'm, if you ask me where I'm based, I'm going to say where my girlfriend is. That's where my base is. <laughs> okay. Let's hold on to this story. Let's see how it goes. Marek, thank you very much for coming. Thanks again for having me. I hope you enjoyed me. it. We're going to subtitle this in Polish uh, for those who prefer it in this language. And we'll have more guests speaking English pretty soon. Thank you very much. Remember to subscribe. And if you haven't smashed that like button, do it right now. And every Thursday, we invite you at 4 o'clock.